I wanted him to hear your story too. Before I start, I'd like to read a little letter that I got from Breakwater Church. It says, Dear Friends at Church on the Beach, I'm celebrating the fact that so many people in Africa have life-saving water because of you. Your humanitarian efforts are touching lives in Malawi, Africa, because you care enough to con contribute towards the insulation of water wells, many people have their first ever clean and easily accessible water. On behalf of the recipients of a new water well and Water Wells for Africa, I thank you for your generous donation in the amount of $8,000. I have great news to share with you. Due to so many generous donors, including you, we have already <coughs> installed more than double the number of wells as we did last year. So our church has sponsored two wells now that will service two different villages up to 50 families with approximately five people per family for up to 20 years. It's amazing. So, and uh, so you're helping to provide water to people in need and for that we thank you, you're amazing. Sakomo, thank you, Kurt Dahlin says you guys are amazing. So that's from Kurt. And uh, it's an ama I've been there four times, it will change your life to be at a water well where we went the last time the well that we sponsored from our church, the lady looked at me and said, since the beginning of the creation of time, we had no hope. As far as they knew in their history, they never, ever, ever had clean water as a nomadic tribe coming out of Mozambique into Malawi. And we were the first ones to give them water that they could drink and not get sick. It was incredible. And then we showed them the Jesus film. And then they got the living water. So it's like, Win, 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 and again, win. <laughs> Woo! So, I'm really excited about what's happening in Kentucky. How many know about the Asbury Revival in Kentucky? It's incredible. Um, you know, I first got wind of it from people in our church who were sending me texts. I started looking at it online. I, I don't look at TikTok, but I, they sent me a TikTok. And uh, I looked at even NBC News was covering it, you know, wow, what's going on, you know? And so apparently started with, they have three services a week at Asbury College um, outside of Lexington in Wilmore? Wilmore. Wilmore. And so in the middle of this typical service, a guy got up and started repenting. Just that, as simple as that. And uh, this is in an area that has a history of revivals over the years. I'll talk about that more later. But then this thing just grew, and before long, everybody's coming into this church, and they've canceled all their classes. And so for 11 straight days, I was watching it online last night. Last night, after 11 days, there was st first time I started to see empty seats. So like, two, like 255 straight hours of worship, 24 hours around the clock of people coming. And so I was talking to our, our friend Bob Sivers, who lives right up the street here, who's a, been a surfer here for years and years, and uh, we're, I got a free spot up here. How many like free spots? <laughs> this week, and Bob pulled in next to me, and we just started talking, and I told him about this revival. He said, are you kidding me? I said, yeah, go check it out. So I go surfing for like an hour and a half. I come back in, and he walks down just as I come in. Coincidence? No. And God was just setting this whole thing up. I, he said, I looked into it, it's legit, I got my plane ticket, I'm going tomorrow. Oh. So, I invited Bob to come this morning and talk to us about what happened in Ashbury. So come on up, Bob. Hey, thanks, Ross. And, um, you know, this thing was, was divine from the start. It wasn't a decision I made. Speak um, up a little of your voice. It, it wasn't. It, it, yeah. That's that's a rarity. Just so you know, um, <laughs> I can talk loud and I can talk forever, and, and I'm going to try and just do the former. But um, uh, so I, I we don't have time for my testimony. But uh, Otz and I uh, were involved in church OCF for years and years, and um, I went astray. And about without without getting into this incredibly powerful testimony that I would be happy to share with anybody at another time. Uh, about a month and a half ago, God revealed himself in the most undeniable ways. Like, Thank you, Jesus. Take a few minutes. Give us like a five-minute verse of your testimony. Okay, I'm going to give you a very short version. Uh, 
after after I moved out of the church and sort of back into the world, um, and I honestly was never really, I never understood the, the concept of letting the Spirit do it. I always thought back when, I mean, I'm just gonna try harder, I'm gonna try harder, I'm gonna try, and it's not, it doesn't work that way. It's if we could do it on ourselves, we don't need any Jesus, we just need us, but we, but we don't. And so, fast forward through year 2000 to just a minute ago, I, I, I went all these different ways and I and I fell for the tickling tickling prophecies and and, and things of, of the world that's going around these days that you can reach God in all these ways and God's everywhere and God's in everything and God's God's God we're all part of God and all this stuff and even the the, the pharmakia the, which is which is which is the word for sorcery in the Bible um, the mushroom thing, I did the journeys and I saw it all and I'm like, God is everything, it's amazing. Well, it turns out that that was a trick. And he showed me that during the midst of one of these things, I pulled the blindfold off that I had doing this thing and I, and I had had a sign from God in the midst of, in 2014, I was in the midst of a very deep depression. And some of you guys may know Mondo from Hope Chapel who moved down to Mexico and I had, I had met him a few times, I barely knew him. I got a message in 2014. He Facebooked me and said, the Holy Spirit told me you're going through something super dark and I'm praying for you. And I was like, what? How could anybody know that? Yet, weeks later, I wrote it off as a coincidence and I went about my ways. So, a month ago, a little more than a month ago, I'm going through one of these mushroom journeys. I pulled the, the mask off and I said, Jesus, I can't give you my whole life if I don't know you're for sure real. And if this book right here, is this book God's word or is this book a bunch of men putting stuff together to win a war in Rome? You gotta tell me, I know, I know I'm not supposed to ask for signs, but I need to know. I said, look, if you're real, mind you, I barely knew Mondo and I hadn't spoken to him he, I saw him once in the parking lot, but I've never had another text or a correspondence. I said, if you're real, have him text me again. I went home, of course there's nothing there, and I'm like, of course there's nothing there. A week later, I'm out here on the beach, meditating, cleaning up trash. I walk up to my house, I look at my phone, and it says, Bob, this is Mondo. I want you to know I'm praying for you, and I want you to know I'm praying for your sons. And I might add that my son, who had completely turned towards dark, demonic stuff, found the Lord two months ago. Wow. So, to me, this isn't a million to one, it isn't a trillion to one, it's infinite, because the Lord's love is infinite, and that's how he found me. So that's quickly my, my testimony, and there's, pull me aside anytime, the Lord has appeared to me in signs and wonders, two, three dozen times since then, and the, one of them I'm gonna share with you today is that over the last month, he put on my heart that, he didn't just do this for me. Like, does he show up and give everybody a sign like that? Two signs, two, two unmistakable signs. And he put it on my heart, no, no, you're supposed to take this and run with it. And there's a word, hinani, in the Bible, and it's a Hebrew word that says, I'm here, Lord. Abraham used it, a few others used it, and it means <coughs> I'm all in. And I told, I told God right there, if you show me this, I'm all in. Well, of course, for a few weeks, I wasn't all in. I wrestled like Jacob. I was like, no, no, I'm not letting go of this. I'm not letting go of that. And it just came, kept put on my heart. And I declare this, the truth of truth. He kept putting revival, revival. You're going to be part of a huge revival. I'm like, what revival? For weeks and weeks, it kept coming back to me. So I walk down and there's Ross in the parking lot and he's like, you hear about the revival? I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, and it, 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 it honestly, nine things like that have happened since then and it doesn't even surprise me now. It, and so it's like, oh, yep, there's the Lord talking to me again. So it's, it's no longer to prove to me that he's real because he's everywhere, he's right here amongst us. And so I bought my plane ticket as I told Ross. Um, I had to kind of go against, uh, you know, some resistance, honestly, from people close to me. And I just, in my mind, it's like, no, I've, I've been disobedient even since I got these signs. So I'm, I'm gonna obey, Lord, I'm just gonna go. I felt like, Abraham, you, you want me to go up and offer offer my, own, my only son? Like, it, whatever it takes, I'm going. And so I went, 
And my wife said, I hope you find what you're looking for. And I said back to her, I said, I'm not looking for anything. I'm just heeding a call. And so I went. And I, I'll tell you, when I got there, it was freezing. It was 30 degrees. We were out on the lawn. I walked up, and first of all, so people are like, she's like, well, I hope it's still going on. And praise the Lord, you just said seats were starting to empty the day after I left. And I didn't know how long to stay or what to do. But I got there and people were, on, were literally on fire. There was a line from here, well past the exit to the parking lot. As thick as this crowd, I'm gonna say there was five to 10,000 people over, over that night. And what I came to do is maybe get an experience. And in the past, you know, like, I've been to the Vineyard Church and some of those churches where it's just all about experience and all about elation. That's great, but that stuff wears off because you leave and you're like, where, where to go? And so I went there looking for, maybe I kind of was looking for that experience. And when I got there, I see this line, there's people everywhere, it's freezing cold. And I'm like, I'm not waiting in that line. I came all this way, I'm not even gonna get into the chapel. And so I, I sat outside next to a heater and people were huddled around and in the interest of time, I won't tell you, but there's different, uh, there, there was prayers that were, were made and fellowship that happened outside that was maybe even more meaningful than inside. And this is a, this was a, a revival of the young. This was a revival. They literally, when I got there, I was a little disappointed. I'm like, oh, I, I'm not even going to be able to get in close because they reserved this for 25 and under. But the, but the, the meat of this was, is that this is a new generation that God is raising up and he brought from there's people from Indonesia, from Brazil, from I, I, the guy next to me, where are you from? Florida. People from coming from everywhere to see what this is about. But really, this was a, about a revival for young adults, for a new generation of believers. And as everybody can see by turning on the news or talking to people or listening to the narrative, there, there, there's been a wicked generation. And I, it's not the people, but it's but but God's allowed Satan and the enemy to to try and try and do what he could but you know what there's a there's an ending to the story and it, it, it's not pretty for the enemy and God was working a wonder to bring these people together and what I witnessed it, there, it was miraculous how I even got in I stood there for three hours it's 30 degrees I'm not dressed for it I didn't even look at the weather before I went I'm dressed <laughs> like, I, I got less than I had now I'm freezing and the people that I was fellowshipping with next to me who live blocks down the road offered to house me and, and let me stay there. There was that There was that community of communion there. And after like three hours, they're like, they just said to some of the people as the, the line never got shorter. In five or six hours, it was it was like a quarter mile long. And and he said, he said hey, he's from California. He's, he's like, go, just go. People were like, yeah, go. I'm like, okay. And then the guy up the top goes, hey, if there's any singles, come on up. So I scoot up and run and I'm sitting in, I sit down in the pew. The guy next to me has got hand warmers, he's, I'm shivering like this. <laughs> and and I'm seeing these young adults with our arms raised, praising God, completely renewed. You can feel it. Did I feel that elation that I felt at times in my own worship? No, I didn't. And you know what? I think it was a lesson for me. I actually walked out after being there for five or six hours and I was a little like wow, that didn't hit me like I thought it was going to hit me. And then I, so at times when I wasn't, I didn't know their worship songs, so I'd sit down and pray. And, it, and, and, then it, and then the Lord revealed to me, it's like, this wasn't about me. This was about, this was about a generation that's being welled up by the word and by the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was there. And I will tell you, I left, I went home, I spoke to a guy who's close to me that's mentored me. We were on the phone until 4.30 in the morning. I woke up the next morning, which was yesterday, so filled with the Holy Spirit that I, I don't think there's been an hour of the day that I have not been praying and praying for people and that the Spirit's been moving through me. And I've learned, I've always wanted to run out and do things. I mean, I'm an achiever. That's what I like to do is so I'm gonna go do it. And God had to just slow me down. I had two signs, and again, I don't, in the interest of time, but I, I had texts that were like, they're like, it's too much from two different people so close to me. I'm like, okay, I'm like, Shh, quiet myself. Let it happen. And more and more and more, I'm trusting to let the Holy Spirit do things through me. And not that's not about me. 
There's not one thing that I've done in the last month or ever in my life that is about me. It's about letting the Spirit run through me. And I just want to ask everybody here, maybe we can just have a quick little prayer for this generation that, that's, been, that's been brought up. And I believe this thing, I, I'm not, I, 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 at some point this thing had to start to, to trickle out, but it's, the message there was, and by the way, I just want to add, this was not a charismatic, like, Boo boo movement. This is a Methodist church with with very very sober sort of sort of vanilla kind of messages, and and, and, and I think it was good to send these people off. So this this could be a road trip, and you're all elated, and you go home, and then nothing happens, you know. Or we can stay sober and just pray and be in the Word and be in the Lord and go home and and bring it back to where you came from. And this is all over the earth. So so this is my prayer. But but if we could just 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 say a prayer right now together. Father God, I'm so grateful that you've intervened in my life, that I could lift you up, not by anything I do, but what you do through the Spirit. Lord, I pray that this revival didn't just happen in Asbury College in, in Wilmore, Kentucky, but this revival is something that's going to spread across the country and, and, and reanoint this country because you chose this country to be a country that proclaimed your name. And like Israel, this country has moved and, and, and rebelled and wandered around in the desert. And it's time, Lord, it's time, Lord, to, to bring a new generation of believers up, to lift us up again and bring this nation to a, a believing nation and one that honors you and one that praises you and lifts you up and holds you above all names for. There's one Lord, there's one, one God. God is not in everything and everywhere. God is around us, but there is one God and one Lord and one Son of God, and that His name is Jesus. Amen. And we Amen. proclaim your name by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we bring it out to the corners of the earth. And I bless and I ask you to bless this church and Ross's ministry. And it's so wonderful to hear the things you guys are doing. And I ask you to bless it and bring that spirit and bring, bring it bright in everyone here that you can walk away today with the spirit bright, bright inside you, and that they work through you, not because of you, but through through us. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Bob. So good. So good to have you. Thank you. Welcome Thank back. You. Welcome Woo. back. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. So, wasn't really sure what to do with the message today and all this. And so, uh, Otz gave me this book that I've been reading, like uh, like two or three pages a day. Better you than me. And uh, it's like a hundred Bible verses that made America what it is. Amen. It's pretty cool. So I just kind of go through here. And so all this is going on, and I thought, well, I'll just read the next page. And it's about the America's Pentecost. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. And it says, uh, after the Revolutionary War, Christianity declined as French agnostics and Enlightenment scholars eroded the faith of thousands in America, right? One North Carolina Christian lamented that few people in the South had ever heard the name of Christ except as a curse. And I was reading other sources, they called it the Egyptian darkness in America. After the American Revolution, there was so much immorality, so much drunkenness, so much just grossness that came in after the war with all from all the soldiers and what they've been doing during the war the church was on the decline right and this was a strong Methodist area in in uh, Lexington so it says here one guy wrote at the close of the long and arduous struggle for independence large districts of the country were destitute of the gospel and the people in great measure seemed to have been given over to intemperance and irreligion the dismanded, disbanded armies carried immorality of the camp into almost every community. The vices contracted there, the infidelity imbibed from French allies were spread. Religion and morals were at the lowest ebb they, had, they have ever reached in America at this time. But things were changing. In the East, revival struck where? Colleges. This is in the late 1700s. Revival struck colleges like Hampton, Sydney, and on the frontier there were unmistakable stirrings of the Holy Spirit. In 1800 and 1801, large crowds showed up for a series of communion services conducted by Presbyterian James McGreedy of Logan, Kentucky. And I looked on the map, and it's just outside of Lexington. 
in the same area. Oh, that's so interesting. So I just turned to the next page to read. Do you get this? This is really cool, right? And so, um, apparently this was an old Scottish thing from over hundreds of years. They would have these big communion weekends and all the different denominations were invited to come in unity. And we've been reading about unity, right? Maintaining unity. And then at the end of the weekend, they would all do communion. So the communion itself was already planned. Among the attenders, attenders was Barton Stone, the pastor of two small churches west of Lexington. Stone went back to his church in Cane Ridge to report on what he'd seen. And I've been reading other sources the last couple of days. There was little revival fire starting throughout the area where the Holy Spirit was moving, people were getting touched. Um, this whole thing about being slain in the Spirit is not new. People would fall as dead men. They really didn't know what to do with it because like Bob is saying, they're very conservative Methodists and Presbyterians and like, what's going on here? And then it would happen to them and they had to deal with it. So they're all trying to keep order. And we'll read that in 1 Corinthians 14 about order. So they're all trying to maintain order and at the same time not quench the spirit. But so they saw this going on. Stone went back to his church in Cane Ridge to report on what he'd seen. I return with ardent spirits to my congregations. I reached my appointment at Cane Ridge on Lord's Day. Multitudes had collected, anxious to hear the religious news of the meeting I attended in Logan, kind of like us hearing from Bob, right? I ascended the pulpit and gave a, a relation of what I'd seen and heard, then opened my Bible and preached from these words, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's all he preached, right? And last night, I was watching this online. People were getting up and preaching the word as God was leading them also in Asbury. So he did that. Well, that verse struck a chord with the church in Cane Ridge. This is right near Lexington as well. There's actually the temp, the meeting house where this happened is still there. It's a historical site, right? So that, uh, that verse struck a chord with the church in Cane Ridge and the members decided to host a similar communion service for their area. Hey, why don't we do communion here? Because look what happened over there. I mean, you know, let's just do what they did. We'll start there. They wanted to reach the region, their new nation, and truly the whole world hearing that verse. Their building was large and could hold 500 people. They erected a tent for overflow, but nobody expected the multitudes who showed up. Just like Asbury certainly didn't expect all this to happen. Stone later described it. The roads were literally crowded with wagons, carriages, horsemen, and footmen moving to the solemn camp. The sight was affecting. It was judged by military men on the ground that there were between 20 and 30,000 collected for, to come meet in a place that held 500. Four or five preachers were frequently speaking at the same time in different parts of the encampment without confusion. There's artist renderings of this online, and it shows all these different uh, like platforms set up in the area around this, this building with preachers all preaching at the same time. And it says in these memoirs that they all preached just the fundamentals of Christianity. There was no division. They were not contradicting each other. They were preaching the pure gospel for the world, right? And it was done in unity. It's a beautiful scene. And it says here, um, without confusion, the Methodist and Baptist preachers aided in the work and all appeared cordially united in it. How cool is that, right? Of one mind and one soul. What are our points in our notes? Look at that. What does it say? What does it say? Be, be unified. Of one mind, right, and soul. Remember, that's the affection. That's the judgment, having an, a, a, one affection for this common cause to bring Christ to the masses, to the nations, to bring freedom for bondage, right? So they were all united of one mind and one soul, and the salvation of sinners seemed to be the great object of all. When we have that, we are unified. If we're all focused on tongues and we're all focused on baptism, we're all focused on our eschatology <coughs> about rapture, and, then we have division. No, 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 no. Let's focus on, keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's what they were doing back in 1801 on August 6th. Amen. We all engaged in singing and, same, and singing the same songs of praise. You know how different churches have different songs? Well, they all agreed on the same songs. 
all united in prayer. I mean, some pray in tongues, some don't pray in tongues, some pray quietly, some, you know, but they all figured it out. You know, like the Koreans all pray out loud at one time, then some churches pray quietly without saying anything. Well, they all prayed in a unified effort. All preach the same things. That's a miracle, right? Because they're just getting up in spontaneous preaching all through these 30,000 people. 30,000, think about that amount of people that were, if Church on the Beach had 30,000 today, it would go from Rosecrans to the Rocks. It's a lot of preachers necessary. There was no amplification, just preacher voices, right? They all preach the same thing. Free salvation urged upon all by faith. Simple gospel. And repentance. That's key. If you study revivals over history, it starts with repentance, confession, somebody getting up, and that's what happened in Asbury. One kid standing up and repenting for his sins, and it started from there. And it happened here back in 1801. Some people start standing up, confessing their sins. And another thing that was happening prior to this movement was there was so much sin in the church. There was so much lukewarmness. You know, I, I mean, in today's day, it would be people living together, getting drunk, doing all those, getting stoned, all those things outside of church time, right? Well, they started coming, you know, there's judgment in the church first, right? We're going to be judged first. So the leaders in all these churches started cracking down and having church discipline to clear the sin out of the camp so that revival could come. And that's not very comfortable for anybody, but all of us should know if we walk with the Lord that as soon as we get rid of those things in our lives, we're more free in the Lord and more ability, we have ability to serve, be filled with the Spirit, and that can usher in the Holy Spirit itself. Yeah. So they started repenting for all these things. Yeah. You see that? Whatever it is, we all have our stuff. It could be overeating. It doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be anything, anything that stops us from being free in Jesus and being mastered by something besides Him. It says, a particular description of this meeting would fill a large volume. If he had, he could fill a whole volume to describe actually what had happened. He said, many things transpired there which were so much like miracles. The meeting continued six or seven days. Seven days. And would have continued longer, but provision for such a multitude failed in the neighborhood. The reason it happened for 11 days in, As in uh, Wilmore's because people started taking in them into their homes. The, I saw the video of the Salvation Army truck there providing blankets and water. People did provide provision, but back in 1800, they had less resources. So after seven days, they all had to go get something to eat. They eventually had to go, you know, go home. The babies were being born. All kinds of things were happening. I need to get home. My wife's about to, is in labor, things like that. I read about one guy I had to go do that. And then unexplainable things happened. Strange manifestations. The wave of emotions that swept over the crowds produced religious ecstasy. People fainting, falling as if dead, jerking. This is where the shakers came out of. People were jerking in the Holy Spirit and nobody really knew what to do with it. These are all conservative Methodists and Baptists suddenly getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were, it was like a battlefield with people laying everywhere just laying down and it's such a mysterious thing if you've never seen it before but i've been reading a lot in the last two days about this revival and it was all over all the revivals in kentucky were marked by a similar manifestation i don't understand it but it was there people were also dancing and running and laughing and singing now some there's always going to be the the wild fringe element right that's just getting a little bit wild maybe they had too much coffee right but then there's sincere people that are really there. And I've been in the midst of this where the Holy Spirit is truly moving and you just, you're just there enjoying the Lord in your different ways. Um, it's estimated that as many as 3,000 people were converted from this one seven day meeting. 3,000, that's like Peter in the book of Acts. I mean, you know, we've had like one or two conversions here per week or sometimes every other week. 3,000 all in one, you know, meeting. That's incredible. So it effectively launched the second great awakening. So there's the first great awakening, then the American Revolutionary War, and then a diminishing 
uh, church going and people walking with the Lord. And then the second great awakening woke America up. Which means, it says the U.S., America was born between two great revivals. The first and second great awakening. Coming as it did at the beginning of the 1800s, it established a basis for the greatest era of national and international missionary expansion here to the here the two in history taking the gospel to every creature this started a massive missions movement because of this and it all started with that one verse go to all the world and preach Amen. the cane ridge sacrament the original communion service has become a legendary event the clearest approximation to an american pentecost prelude to a christian century it arguably remains the most important religious gathering in all of American history, both for what it symbolized and for the effects that flowed from it. Thanks, Ots, for the book. So, is that cool or what? So, I've been just writing some notes, you know, uh, because God wants to keep doing this. It's not like, oh, great, that was 11 days, now let's all go back into our our lukewarm existence and kind of no I so I've been I wrote some notes here this morning and uh, it says here I got this off another source revival is often emerged after an intense time of prayer and confession so one thing we need to be doing is be praying for the church praying for our neighbors I, I encourage you guys to pray for your street I've been praying for my street. In my mind, I go up and down each house and I pray for them by name, the ones I know. And we know a lot of our neighbors because since the kids were little, we've been going selling lemons or, or caroling or doing this and that. And I just pray for my whole street that the Holy Spirit will just come upon my street and just, you know, the Holy Spirit has come to judge us, our sin. We don't need someone to tell us usually, but it helps. The Holy Spirit shows us we're sinners, that the Holy Spirit will move, convict, and then set them free because His kindness leads to repentance. Amen? Not just to zap them, but to bring them into freedom. So I pray for my street. So I encourage you to pray for your cul-de-sac or pray for your block and get to know who you live next door to. And then pray for the, our church. Pray for the church at large. And then pray that people will confess their sins. It begins with repentance begins repentance it says in the word if you confess your sins one to another you will be healed that's talking about spiritual healing and then physical healing. so find an accountability partner somebody you can confess your sins to or at least start by confessing them to God right it says here Cane Ridge was no exception recognizing that many people on the western frontier were indifferent to faith or actively opposed <coughs> to it Pastors and Christians began to set aside time for prayer that revival might come. Right now, uh, Greg Laurie has his church praying at 714 every day. Because uh, Chron 2 Chronicles 714 says, If my people will humble themselves and pray, then I'll hear their prayer and heal their land. So I'll, I'll be praying about something we can do. In the, in the meantime, pray. I don't have anything set up officially right now. This is all hot off the press. But, uh, but we need to pray for revival. Our country is ripe for this, you guys. It is ripe. There's a lot of disillusioned people. You know, people that went to Cane, uh, that went to Asbury and, and met the Lord this last week, that same age group is also killing themselves. The average of every 11 and a half minutes in the country, someone's committing suicide because they have no hope. So this is, we're ripe. For this to happen that's why it's happening and it happened in the same place in uh, 1970 in Lexington and also in 1995 in Lexington it's half you can look throughout the history for whatever reason in that part of the country maybe because they also get flooded out by mass floods every year and they have tornadoes and ice storms their life is not necessarily comfortable but they are hungry if you hunger this is the verse that God put on my heart on the way down here this morning from Matthew 5 the, if you hunger and thirst you for righteousness, you will be filled. But you got to be hungry. You know, if you're full with other stuff, 
If you ate a bunch of cookies before dinner, it's gonna be hard to eat that delicious steak that you just got served. Oh man, that looks amazing. But I ate too many cookies. So in the same way, we could be filling our life with all this junk, and then when we get time for the real thing, there's no room for it. Amen? Amen. We need to hunger for, this, for Jesus. I saw a shirt on my friend on the East Coast when I visited uh, a couple years ago. It said, binge Jesus. If you want to binge Amen. something, binge Jesus. And those guys are fun. They were all drunk in the Holy Spirit. This is a whole other subject. They couldn't stop laughing every time we went. Restaurants, everything else. Um, their realtors actually in their whole office was drunk in the Holy Spirit. It was so interesting. Wealthy Christian realtors full of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, convinced that iniquity impedes revival, many churches tried to clean up their own ranks by removing from fellowship those who had drifted into overt sin. So, I'm not going to go around as a policeman here. That's not my job. However, I want each of you to judge yourselves soberly. And if you read the Word every day, if you're reading through the book of John, you'll use that as your litmus test. Remember in science class, the little blue and pink papers, we check for acids and bases. Use the Bible as your litmus test to see how you're doing. And if there's some sin in your life, repent. Get rid of it, because you don't want to be mastered by anything but by Jesus Himself. Amen? Amen. And there's little things and big things, right? So... Revival began in 1800 in Kentucky under the exhortations of a fiery preacher. That spoke to me. Maybe I need to be more fiery. I don't know. It's not really my style. But I get excited because Jesus is amazing. I mean, He saved my life. And I can't stop talking about it. They had fiery preachers. And they would exhort them. It said after this fiery preacher was exhorting, this James McGreedy in Logan County, for a long time, a woman who for a long time had been seeking assurance of salvation suddenly broke into songs and shouts of joy and people began to weep and sought a similar assurance. They were afraid they were going to be saved. News of their newfound hope spread like wildfire through Kentucky and people in nearby regions began to attend the services. Here's the key. Thirsting. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? It says in Isaiah 55, all who have thirst come to Jesus. All who have no money come buy and eat. And he says, I will satisfy your thirst. Right? They started to thirst to partake of the Lord's salvation. Several small revivals spread out from the center, but the main attraction was still to come. And that's what I just talked about. The great Cane Ridge Revival in the same place this one was happening. So I wrote this down in my notes this morning. Before the revival, there was low church attendance. Right now, this latest generation is the least churched of all generations in American history. The current children being born in elementary school. And they're not going to find out about the gospel in the public school system. And they're not going to find out about it at daycare. And they're not going to find out about it at a soccer game or at surf club. They're going to find out about it from us. And for if you have influence in your lives from grandpas and grandmas and cousins, we need to speak into these young people's lives, right? We need So there's low church attendance. There was sin in the church. It had to be cleaned out. There were prayer. Another uh, revival to look up is the Isle of Hebrides prayer, revival. Duncan Campbell. Two ladies prayed for that one before it broke out. Prayer is important. Repentance and then confession. So, that's the message today. Is that okay? Yeah. We didn't get into a lot of scripture today, but, um, but, but James says, confess your sins so that you may be healed. How many need some kind of emotional healing? It's okay to be honest about that. Anxi we have anxieties, things like that. How many need physical healing? Okay. How many need social healing? Like trying to get it right with that person. You know what I'm talking about? It's in Luke 2.52 says that Jesus grew in stature, wisdom, favor with God, and favor with man. So physical, mental, social, and spiritual. God wants us to fire on all four cylinders. And then we have a nice solid table with four legs. 
stature, wisdom, favor with God, favor with man. Vertical, horizontal, right? And that happens when we repent and get right with God. So I want everybody right now to close your eyes and just take stock in your life right now, between you and the Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, just move right now and convict us of our unrighteousness. Search our hearts. Test our anxious thoughts. Show us if we have any iniquity in us. Let it start with us, Lord, with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Just saturate right now, Lord. Percolate. Shed light on, on who we are, Lord, before You. We fall so short of Your standard, Lord. We've all fallen short of Your glory. There is no one like You, Lord. There is no one like You. No one besides You who saves. You are perfect in holiness. There is no one that will ever be like You. All of our works are filthy rags in Your sight. We thank You for Your blood, Jesus, that You shed for us. Holy Spirit, come. Just as we sang earlier. Holy Spirit, come.